Welcome everyone. I'm John Pescatori. My fancy title at SANS is the Director of Emerging Security Trends. Uh, it's about now my ninth year at SANS after almost 14 years as a lead security analyst at Gartner and spent my entire security career, my entire career in security, starting right out of college at NSA and the US Secret Service and over a decade with GT and then on to the internet world of firewalls with trusted information systems and PKI with and trust before coming to Gartner. Got a fun topic here. I'm gonna do about a 30 minute session and sort of give you 60 years of history of AI and machine learning and sort of um, put on my Gartner hat and sort of debunk some myths and some hype around it and then drill down a little bit into cybersecurity use cases. And then there's going to be a following session by uh, Dave Holzer with some great demos, some hands on demos of implementing some algorithms in Python code and uh, some security functions. So this one precedes Dave's talk and I'll stay a little bit at the 50,000 foot level, but definitely drill down and and uh, be able to answer your questions through the uh, text mechanisms as we go along. So let's get started. So just a little terminology, we're going to talk about AI or artificial intelligence, and that is pretty much what it sounds like. It's us attempting to make computers mimic what humans do as far as problem solving generally. And we're going to zero in on a subset of all that, which is machine learning, which is we're trying to fool people into thinking the computer is solving problems without actually being programmed. Now, we always have to program computers. They don't do much without us. Um, but rather than sort of rigid algorithms or single use functions, you know, not as not just calculate the trajectory of rockets and bombs, but figure out the best way to hit a moving ship from another moving ship, you know, might be something you might think of old use as a machine learning. We're not really going to talk about sort of something you hear a lot about deep learning, which is where we start trying to involve neural networks and try to really make CPUs uh, add up to acting like the human brain does, which can be a good thing in many cases, in many cases not so good a thing, but is very hard to do. So we're going to focus pretty much completely here on machine learning. And what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of drill down there. So there's two broad classes of machine learning you'll hear about. The, the bottom one you see there is supervised learning. This is essentially where, um, you know, the simple ones you might think of have a bunch of inputs and a bunch of outputs, a bunch of dots on a graph that we have an X axis and a Y axis and the computer says, here's the equation that makes those lines or here's, to, here's how to connect those dots and, and a line or a curve that fits them. So often it's minimizing the errors between the line and the dots. And you often hear machine learning called minimize loss losses and since ML. Now the, the sort of holy grail or the more glamorous case is unsupervised or autonomous learning, where you just sort of dump a lot of data into the top of the computer and it starts doing something with that data. Now mostly it turns out that's good for clustering where it can tell you these events or these pieces of data that were tagged in certain ways, they're related to each other in this blob over here, or this cluster. And there's another cluster over there that's related to each other. And we'll drill down on that. You might think of in a cybersecurity case, here's a bunch of things sysadmins were doing that probably were good things. They were doing backups or, or uh, uh, replicating databases. Here's a bunch of, here's a cluster of things sysadmins are doing, but they only looked at one record at a time. That could be a bad thing. That could be an attacker. That could be, uh, uh, sysadmin gone bad and starting to surf the database. So uh, those are the two broad classes. And we're going to get back into the real world example of these later. But I promised you 60 years of history. So let's, uh, let's tackle that. So here's something Harvard put together a few years ago in a, in a paper they wrote that was very interesting. They, you see the timeline of the history of the term artificial intelligence, and it sort of really dates back to 1950 to 1960. In 1950, Alan Turing published Can Machines Think, which started this, and he's the creator of the famous Turing test, which is still used today to determine if natural language processing that computers do could really fool somebody into believing it's a human. Now, if you see that blue curve and the numbers on the left hand side. What they also did is over the years, they ran LexisNexis searches of the LexisNexis database for the term artificial intelligence. And the blue line represents sort of the popularity of the term, what percent of all LexisNexis items contain the word AI. So it sort of is like a popularity curve. Now I'm not gonna drill down in many of these, but let's state the start when the term first came out is say 1950. And you can zoom forward. I like to zoom forward to where you see autonomous vehicles there in 1986, the first autonomous car is built by Carnegie Mellon. 
wait a minute, 1986, it's now 2021. So we're 36 years later and we're still talking about autonomous vehicles. So machine learning to drive cars around, we're still not really ready to do. Some other seminal events there, you see in 1997, IBM's Deep Blue beat uh, chess master Gary Kasparov in chess. That was sort of when everybody began to say, uh oh, we're doomed. The computers are just going to take over. They can beat us at chess now. And about that same year was when Dragon Systems put out the first sort of semi-usable speech recognition software that would run on an IBM PC. And that was sort of when everybody said, well, you know, it's sort of over with. The computers have won. Well, the problem is that, no, they really didn't win. Here we are again, 21 years later, still complaining about how bad Siri is at voice recognition. And while the computers have gone on to beat uh, masters at other games like Go and Jeopardy even, um, we haven't seen them solve a lot of the unbounded problems we need to deal with. And we'll drill down on that in a little bit. Now, I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to put my Gardner hat on here for a bit. One of the more fun things and I think useful things we did at Gardner is something called a hype curve. And you see one on your screen there for artificial intelligence. Let me tell you how they work. On the left, you see innovation trigger. These are new things that come about. And, and artificial intelligence is what you can think of quantum computing or blockchain as showing up somewhere. And you see quantum computing here. Anything new immediately or quickly generally zooms up to the peak of overinflated expectations. It gets hyped up. Quantum computing is going to kill encryption or it's going to make the bad guys win. And then it uh, zooms down into the trough of disillusionment where it turns out, well, it's really hard to do quantum computing, right? And what the heck is blockchain doing for us anyway? And then some things get stuck in that trough of disillusionment and go away. I remember years ago, uh, remember the that uh, uh, two wheel thing, Segway? like a lawnmower with two wheels you stand on and ride around. That was going to revolutionary, revolutionize highways and, and force cars off the road. And, and now it's sort of like, yeah, I think tourists use them in a lot of cities, but you don't see a, maybe a mailman or two. You don't see a heck of a lot of segues anymore. Um, but in, in, in most cases, in many cases, technology does escape that trap and then uh, flows out into the plateau of productivity there. And I'm actually going to get rid of my little video windows up here so I can see. And you see in this case on AI, um, graphics process processing unit accelerators to run a lot of the number crunching for machine learning is something that's in this plateau of productivity. It just works. And these days with what's happening with Alexa and okay, I'll give Siri a break and other medical uses and other things of speech recognition, it's just a commonly used technique. So that's out in the plateau of productivity. So here, if you look, if you can see my cursor, if we look in the middle of the curve here, you see machine learning and that's what we're gonna zoom into. So this was the 2019 Magic Quadrant from Gardner. And using some fancy computer animation, I'll show you how things moved in the 2020 version. And you see machine learning really hasn't made a heck of a lot of progress there. Really not too many things have made progress. If you look down here in the trough of disillusionment, coded to be obsolete before plateau, you see cognitive computing, which is really a very high level term for essentially computers being able to think and act and communicate like humans. So I think the, the feeling is they're really not gonna, ever really reach that point, no matter how many MIPS we can throw at them or megabytes or new types of technology or cooling systems or quantum computing. But we want to focus on machine learning anyway. So let's drill down. Turns out Gardner also did a separate magic quadrant. I mean, I'm sorry, hype cycle just on machine learning you see on your screen now. So in this case, we'll look at a couple of things that are meaningful in security. Advanced anomaly detection, where you see the red arrow pointing. That's really what we're trying to do in security with these tools is move beyond simple signature-based detection of what's malware or simple signature-based rules for intrusion detection and prevention and have some tools that are able to say, hey, a bunch of stuff just happened. It looks suspicious. It looks like this. It looks anomalous and it looks like a dangerous Anonymous. That's what we're looking for. But I wanted to point a few others out. If you see down here towards the trough, you see Python. Python is the most popular programming language used in uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And it has lots of library functions for all the complicated math that's needed to do, uh, the, do the, create the models and run the algorithms in machine learning. And Spark is sort of a analytics data processing engine that's widely used in AI and machine learning as well. So in this case, in 2019, Gardner had them essentially near the trough of disillusionment, which basically nobody understood at the time when this came out, since these were widely used even back in 2019. And it would have made a lot more sense to see them further up the plateau. But we're really interested in advanced anomaly detection. So let's look at the 2021 and see what happened. 
And what happened is it disappeared. Wait a minute, where, I don't see anomaly detection on there anymore. In fact, I don't even see Python. I do see Apache Spark moved out to the left on the plateau where it should be. And if you read the text, you see on the left, they said, we don't see anybody even talking about advanced anomaly detection anymore, so we dropped it. <laughs> so what that tells you is it hasn't really been tremendously useful for advanced anomaly detection, just magically finding bad stuff among good stuff without also false alarming a lot. And again, we'll drill down into, into that quite a bit as well. Um, Spark got widely adopted, and it said, yeah, Python's also widely adopted, so we, we just pushed it off the hype cycle. So it was a recognition that Python and Spark are really useful tools. Um, I'm going to give you some URLs at the end for you could do some more drill down, and you'll see Dave Holzer doing his on-screen demo uh, using uh, Python. I believe he's using Spark as well. So that sort of shows you um, where things progressed in the hype, and let's start moving more towards the reality. But before I did that, I want to give you an example of some recent hype. And I'm going to pick on Microsoft. There was hundreds of vendors I could have chose. I just thought Microsoft slide captured everything all in one slide. So as you know, built into Windows, Microsoft has lots of things like Windows Defender that are antiviral type things. And they also sell other products that, that do security stuff and find security stuff. So, and they talked about it in this one slide, they used every possible buzzword around machine learning and AI that you could have. You see at the very top on the client level, client machine learning, what runs on a Windows PC, they have models, behavior-based detection, algorithms, generics, and heuristics. By the way, let me give you one bit of wisdom I learned over those 14 years at, at Gardner. Whenever I heard a vendor use the H words, heuristics or holistic, I knew they were sort of blowing smoke. You know, I always said heuristic meant heuristics meant not documented and holistics meant not existent basically. Um, but we like to talk about holistic security and, and heuristics. And you know, that really means uh, they're, they're not something we can nail, nail down very well. So then that's what runs on Windows in the end End, end point that's the on the pc that's the important part because that's where the attackers are hitting you think about this solar winds thing uh, if, if we didn't get them when they got to the client side we were too late now out in the cloud where the client can call out to in the cloud um, microsoft has all kinds of other things running machine learning metadata based models sample analysis based machine learning models, destination based machine learning models and the magical big data analytics down there all running out at the cloud doing things. And they give you an example of, a, of a, using them against the smoke loader campaign and behavior based. But one thing I'm going to highlight at the end, I'm going to emphasize at the end is you very rarely see the hype around machine learning talking about false positives. They're very good at saying, see, look, we look for this type of thing. The, the model found it every single time. We never missed it. Well, how many times did the model declare some good behavior or good events to be the malicious ones? That, that, that's a very important number to ask any vendor that's hyping up this type of technology in, in their products. So that's the sort of a quick tour through the hype level. And you know, in, in security, I've worked in uh, cryptography for many years and hearing Wall Street call blockchain crypto or talk about crypto is just, well, they don't understand what they're talking about. They're just hyping something up and they're, they're sort of distorting things. Same thing with when people think about machine learning or AI is, oh yeah, the software that just finds stuff. You just throw data at it and it tells you what's in there. And there's magical examples, you know, in the business domain of how it found uh, people buy men buy beer and diapers at two in the morning in the in the grocery store. Well, it turns out somebody asked the software, what do men buy at the same time when they're in the grocery store at two in the morning, which is often either where they were sent out to get diapers or, or uh, felt they needed to get some beer. When we start looking at both things like uh, the business domain or the cybersecurity domain, where the success stories and use of the technology is, it's really in observing and being able to inject domain expertise into the software in a variety of ways. Expert systems, trying to copy what the expert does. Case-based reasoning is an example I've seen for many years that's really effective. Um, oh, in the case of, you know, for example, in the case of uh, uh, power companies needing to maintain their power lines, well, one of the most common reasons they come down are, are uh, trees falling on the wires or falling across the wires um, due to storms or simply due to lack of trimming and being able to use very simple techniques to determine when a storm's gonna hit and which way it's gonna travel or how long it's been since the last time a particular run had the trees trimmed and how quickly they grew in the last period. Those are simple case-based reasoning tools that can really be implemented in software well 
to help get the repair crews out in advance and shorten the time down or eliminate time down by trimming the trees before they fall on the wires. Then there were things like fuzzy logic. I never really understood that one. I remember windshield wipers were supposed to have fuzzy logic so that I wouldn't need to turn them slow, fast, medium. They would somehow figure out how much water was on the windshield, but that all seemed to go away. But things like micro-targeting, uh, which is what we saw the Russians do against the United States and Facebook and so on around the 2016 election, um, are very good examples of taking domain expertise. Somebody who figured out how do we attack small places and, and call, get great leverage out of that and use automated ways to get the right message to the right, or the wrong message to the right person to cause things to happen is a very uh, important use of it, a very creative and very illustrative use of of these technologies. And again, it required that domain expertise. It was not just the computer spraying out messages. Another thing I'll, I'll emphasize again at the end, and I think it's important to get across to CIOs and COOs and board of directors, just because computers can beat us at games like chess or Jeopardy or Go, doesn't really translate very well to the cybersecurity world. A chessboard is a fixed dimension. The pieces can only do certain things. The what, What's that thing called? The horse, the knight. The knight can only move in that L-shaped direction most times. Um, every now and then it can castle. But the knight can't say, I'm going to jump off the end of the board and pop up through the bottom. And the bishop can't say, I'm tired of going diagonally. I'm going to go straight across, and I'm going to just knock everything out of my way. Hackers can do that to us in cyber. There are not boundaries on the problem. There's a long history of why that's so in the complexities of software. But beating human beings at games does not really translate necessarily into beating hackers at their game, because it's not a game. It's a craft for them. And again, there are no boundaries. There's very few rules. So let's look at some of the successful uses and try to draw out how we can use this technology successfully in cybersecurity. So the business use is where we saw a lot of this first time. Businesses collect lots of data. They want to optimize their sales and marketing resources or their product development resources and make the best decisions. So here's a typical marketing example. We're at the top of this funnel. They had a bunch of names from databases or subscriptions or whatever possible people to sell their product to. And then they started to say, well, if we called every one of those names, even with some cheap college kid uh, working on the weekends for pennies, we'd waste a lot of money. How do we zero in on the ones most likely to be receptive to buying our product. And so then they use some factors to determine if a person's engaged, they visited the booth, clicked on something on the website, pretended to listen at a webinar while they really read, the, read their email. Um, and that got to the engage level. Then Marketing Qualified took those names and figured out which ones demographically or geographically um, meet the profile or had good digital body language. We're often seen on social media in, in, in forums related to the, the product and so on. And that essentially comes down to a sales qualified lead where we take scarce, scarce human resources, inside sales folks or direct sales folks, and sick them on the people and talk them into at least trying our product and maybe buying it. We get them on the pipeline and then we win. So what we did is turn a bunch of names into revenue at the bottom. Now the computer software used to do this was critical, but it wasn't simply pour names at the bottom and orders at the top and orders fall out the bottom. We used a lot of hard learned marketing lessons from smart marketing and salespeople over the years to implement this in this funnel that, that made this happen. Uh, and that's sort of, this is the most successful example in these same needs to do this, good data, labeling the data. These are engaged people. These are marketing qualified leads. These are from this geography. These are this age range. These are this sex. These are this language. Labeling the data is key. The quality of the data is key. So cybersecurity, very similar. Um, most of the success stories have been really smart security people being able to implement some of the ways they do things in software or really smart software people being observed what really smart security people do what we call the security unicorns and be able to give them some tool to make let the security unicorns focus on the really high value problems and then pass on some of that expertise in the models in the algorithms um, so the algorithms can be used to prioritize events or indicate candidate events that more junior analysts can uh, respond to. And, and by the end of the day, we're hoping that by 
ordering the events and the most likely to be dangerous, we'll get to all the important ones because that's the name of the game. Within the bounds of our resources, can we hit all the important things? If you think of the solar wind things again, if there was, we we're finding now the indicators of once uh, the compromised solar wind software started to be used for the attacks, if we'd have more quickly detected those indicators, um, just think of how much less damage uh, would have occurred. So I can't emphasize enough the quality of the uh, response and the action is so tightly related to the quality of the data. It's not simply let's throw every syslog we have at it or every piece of data we can find at it. Um, most uh, SANS instructors will tell you that, yeah, you know, it's good, more data is important, but the right data is most important. And the quality of that data, the accuracy of the data, the timeliness, the freshness of it, and so on is so, is so important. It's, you know, garbage in, garbage out. That, that law does not change just because we have really fast computers and Python and Spark to throw at the data. So, you know, in, in most of the many years I've worked in internet security, the, the problem you see up here is what we've been dealing with. We've got a lot of data at the top of this funnel, a lot of raw attack data hitting firewalls or routers and logs and SIM events starting to pile out. And we're trying to get that down to the bottom, which are the ones we have to initiate actions quickly against. And it's really important to be keeping these metrics both on uh, what's our status of prevention and detection, but also how quickly we're moving and actually less important, what quantity of things do we see? We always wanna keep track of quantity so we can convince management we're doing something, uh, but really how fast we move in internet security and how accurate our actions are is really what's key. So we take that same funnel approach and we look at the uses for AI, ML, we want to, machine learning, we want to feed more data, we want to make sure that's clean and relevant data, apply that domain expertise and go through all these steps. And at the bottom line, we want to move faster. We want to have less mission impact from two vectors, one from the bad guys. We want to reduce the impact the bad guys have on the business or the mission, but also reduce the impact from the security measures, whether it's false positives that are really disruptive or simply disruptions as we clean systems up or as we uh, shut things down or disconnect when we start when we are required to investigate. Bottom line, faster and, and helping the business, not hurting the business. So let's drill down a little bit. You'll see again, uh, Dave Holzer will present some of these things, but in the different types of machine learning, clustering has been very useful. So this ability to use unsupervised or automated machine learning tools to say, uh, if you look at this graph, this blob of events, are, they're all related. This blob over here is also all related. By quickly saying, sampling a few in those blobs, we can say, oh, anything that falls in this blob is probably going to be bad. Anything that falls in this blob, we better drill down into because that may be a, a normal or privileged user doing something that appears dangerous. So the supervised learning where we take, here's a set of inputs and set of outputs has been really useful for classifying things. This is malware or not malware, spam or not. This is uh, ransomware trying to encrypt things, or this is a breach trying to exfiltrate things. Now, when you take these two types of techniques and certain blobs may lend themselves to being better fed to certain engines that are focused on certain events, uh, classified as certain events, commonly using both techniques together, uh, we, we can get cybersecurity value. So the, the one that's been used for years, this is nothing new, the Symantex and McAfee's and Trends have been doing this for years in, uh, in their labs and now in the cloud uh, is basically saying, here's a bunch of good files and now here's a bunch of bad files. And so from the good files, you extract features. And as we feed your bad files, you look at their features and we have a model that spits out at the end. Yeah, that last thing you fed me looks more like a bad file than a good file. The last one you fed me looks more like a good file than a bad file. Um, so the more data we can feed it to, to make that uh, those features more meaningful or more specific, um, the better the accuracy can get and the, the uh, smarter the techniques and models that are used and the faster things can be done, we can be more accurate and more timely as well. And so in malware detection, you know, quite often you'll, you'll see this. This is to some extent signatures brought up to the next level when you think about it. Now, a little more um, esoteric use is, this is an example from Enteros, who's a supply chain security company. And their whole goal is to sell you um, software and services where you look at all your supply chain providers and determine what risk level you have from them. And one thing they've been doing with machine learning is using natural language processing models and they feed them in news articles from API feeds, from RSS, from uh, websites and the like news articles about companies and the models extract which company, what type of events, and they do that cluster and classifying we just talked about. And they basically identify which company 
or companies is involved, and then they link them to risk events that come out of Interos analyst things about risk, and they'll tell you, well, wait a minute, we just, you know, obviously solar winds is now judged as highly risky because it's been in the news. But if you think about a company that went bankrupt or a company that had a breach, well, if it turned out that seven other companies used that company um, or uh, just hired somebody from that company, these type of techniques might say your supply chain partner wasn't directly breached, uh, but they either are using suppliers who were breached or they've been hiring people who've uh, ha either had bad luck or maybe evil. Um, so this is an example of using natural language processing and news feeds to try to highlight a cybersecurity risk in a supply chain. That's kind of cool. Now, there's lots of toolkits out there to build build your own examples and play with these in a, in a number of different ways. And I list SciKit and TensorFlow up there, which are two you can play with in the Microsoft Azure one. Um, Dave Bianco has a great example here in this tool called ClearCut. You see his GitHub re repository there. Now, what he put together is essentially a model or an engine where you can feed it in HTTP records, HTTP traffic records, and it'll tell you if it sees anything that looks like command and control traffic, which would tell you that something on the inside got compromised and is talking out to the command and control center to download the next stage or start to exfiltrate and so on. And uh, he's been uh, adding to that over the years. You'll see many other things he's done there and, and others. Um, and um, You'll also find lots of libraries I mentioned in Python for all the sort of basic tools you need to do a lot of the big data processing functions and the math to implement these. Another area, and this is Dave Holzer's GitHub page, and you'll hear from Dave uh, in that next session I keep hyping up. Um, the thing he did, if you see the uh, check your, your Pulse uh, Secure there. So the Pulse Secure VPN um, appliances and software have had a bunch of vulnerabilities and Pulse Secure put out patches. These date back to, mid 2019 or let's see if this 20, 2019 mid 2019 people have been very slow especially government agencies to patch these so many vpn servers running pulse secure software have been compromised and they put together a tool that looks at the log files that come from pulse secure and can tell you hey this looks like it might have been compromised the, the way this thing's behaving the way it's talking the way it's accepting connections this may very well have been compromise. So it's an example of a specific vulner high criticality vulnerability like in Pulse Secure and using these techniques to not just look for signatures, you know, sort of simple IDS signatures of meeting attackers against it, but looking at the behavior of the inputs and outputs of that server via the log events and uh, determining that something may have gone wrong. One last example, and it's kind of pointing out where the human expertise is needed. Endgame's a company that did a lot of machine learning and uh, endpoint detection and response tool. They were acquired by Elastic, a big uh, data search engine uh, company that's widely used. And this is an example of one of their cool tools that uh, from their machine learning module that essentially they threw lots of events at it and uh, classified things in certain ways. And if you look under the view by, you see the job ID, you know, think of those as processes running. And you can quickly zoom into the series of red things you see on the sort of middle, uh, middle right there. And the demo status code rate is coded red. And if you look down at the bottom, you can see the severity threshold warning and time, February 1st, 2017, severity 99. And it says, NGINX access source IP high count. So this is saying some code path uh, was executed way more frequently than normal. And uh, you should drill down on this. You know, it seems like it's sort of a simple threshold alert, but you look at all the data on the screen and what you would need to do to really understand what's going on. Just using many of these machine learning products requires skill, if nothing else, skill and knowledge of that tool. But in reality, skill and knowledge of the basic concepts of machine learning and of information security in general to understand and be able to use the tools in a meaningful way. So again, keep that in mind. Um, staff training and domain expertise is what underlies all successful uses. You know, these tools can be force multipliers, but if your force is close to zero, you can't multiply it all that much. And really key, none of these tools fully automate anything. If you're not already doing something, you can't automate it. You cannot automate what you don't already know how to do. The quality of the data is really key. The noisiness of the data you can't just say, let's feed the computer a bunch of noise and it'll find a signal. You have to feed it something that has a signal in it somewhere or uh, all that's gonna come back out is noise. And uh, again, I can't emphasize enough this part about, I do a lot of board of directors briefings and I try to make sure this is well known because there's this assumption that uh, uh, 
the fact that computers want to chess in jeopardy, which I think really blew away a lot of board of director types, um, it means a lot more than it really does in cybersecurity. And again, I hit this several times, false positives are the traditional killer of security advances. All it takes is one false positive where we shut the database down or disconnect from the internet or, or blow the ability to meet the numbers for the quarter. And we've just pushed the security program back years. So a false negative missing an attack seems bad, but quite often a false positive can actually be more dangerous than a false negative. Always ask about false positive rates uh, when you're evaluating products claiming to use machine learning or AI or uh, someday uh, deep learning. So bottom line is, uh, unfortunately, there is still no such thing as a free lunch. As we all know, the triad of first having people, smart people, skilled people who can work together and develop and document useful and, and, and adaptable processes to, to get ahead of the bad guys or at least keep even with the bad guys and then implement some of those or all of those as much as possible, those, tech, those processes using technology that can sort of be a force multiplier for those scarce number of humans. Those three things together are what underlie the, every success story we've ever had in cybersecurity. I do a thing for SANS called the What Works Program where we highlight sort of these and you never just find, oh yeah, we just bought this tool and everything got better. Or we just hired Sally and everything got better. It's always a mix of all three of these that uh, all of a sudden the aha moment comes up and we're able to demonstrate to management. Hey, look, you saw in the news who got hit by this? We didn't get hit by this because here's what we were doing. So kind of summing up, I wanted to leave you with some resources. There's the SANS reading room where you can see all the white papers and things we continue to publish, including from uh, the students that take our master's class. We make them all do master's papers on, on meaningful topics so we get to publish them and help uh, the rest of the world out. Um, there's a link to uh, Dave Hold Holzer's Practical Machine Learning YouTube video. It's uh, cool to watch, or uh, uh, you might want to watch that after you watch his session next. Chris Davis did a very cool YouTube video as well. I think it's actually a presentation, if I remember right, that he did at KringleCon in 2019 on uh, cybersecurity machine language use cases. And he'll give you a little repeat of some of what I did and then do, he does some really cool drill down. And I just wanted to close with a cool program SANS invested in um, called CyberStart over the years. And it's culminated in uh, rolling out across many states now, getting high school kids um, free access to SANS online training. And if they can succeed in games and take the training and pass the courses, they can win scholarships and uh, colleges and, and uh, community colleges and community colleges and get a bad applied bachelor's degree in cybersecurity. So for your kids, your brother, your sister, your nieces, nephews, your neighbor's kids, your grandkids, if you're old, like some people are uh, out there, uh, <laughs> refer them to this program. It's really cool. And it's something we're investing in to just try to get more people into this industry and help advance the state of the people so we can take more advantages of tools like machine learning. So with that, uh, thanks and enjoy the rest of the program.